On December 26, less than two months after the Bolshevik seizure of power in 1917, the Soviet of People's Commissars appropriated two million gold rubles for the support of world revolution. The Soviet of People's Commissars considers it necessary to offer assistance by all possible means, including money, to the left international wing of the labor movement of all countries. Thus was established a basic principle of international communism, namely, world revolution under the assistance and guidance of the Soviet Union. The year 1919 saw the founding of the International Organization of Communist Parties, the Communist International, or Comintern, as it was called. In 1919, in Moscow, a meeting of the Politburo debated the importance and function of the new organization. There were five members of the Politburo at that time. Lenin, the acknowledged leader of the party and the new Russian state. Trotsky, outstanding propagandist and organizer of the Red Army. The theoreticians Bukharin and Kamyenev. And Joseph Stalin, a party functionary. Uh, the tactical problem of the moment is one of ensuring coordinated leadership for the forthcoming revolutions in Germany, Austria, and Bulgaria. Ah, perhaps you're right, Vladimir Ilyich. But are we certain that the situation is genuinely ripe for revolution? All the more reason, my dear Bukharin, for assuring real communist leadership against the mere reformists, particularly the social democrats. Rigid discipline imposed from above on those organizations willing to join us and a campaign, both legal and illegal, to attract the masses to the communist banner, that is what the communist international should be striving for. And uh, who but ourselves should be uh, making these preparations and determining the time to strike? Exactly. Our first objective should be to prepare for the proletarian revolution in the more advanced and industrialized countries. Without this, socialism in Russia may perish. We must not for one moment forget that socialism must be international. Trotsky, you're just spreading your theory of the permanent revolution again. Kamenev, you're not the realist you think you are. You know as well but as I, I do that I revolution in Trotsky, advance... You know very well. Well. Please, Com I'm Comrades, please. There's so much work to be done. Uh, Comrade Stalin, have you anything to say at this point? Only that having our agents in other countries is probably useful. Our agents? You talk like a Russian nationalist, not a communist. The revolution must be international in order for communism to succeed. The expected upheavals never took place except for abortive uprisings in Germany and a short-lived communist regime in Hungary. As a result of these failures, the communists outside of Russia gradually became exactly what the Kremlin wanted them to become, agents of Soviet policy. However, the main objective of the Comintern, world revolution followed by the dictatorship of the proletariat, has never changed. The history of international communism is extensively documented in the Hoover Institution on War, Revolution and Peace at Stanford University. Here to comment on international communism is the assistant director of the Hoover Institution, Witold Swarakowski. The first international organization of socialist-oriented workers was created in 1864 by Karl Marx. This so-called first international was little more than a discussion club for the airing of workers' grievances and was dissolved in 1876. The second international, founded in 1889, six years after Marx's death, was a loose organization of socialist parties in various countries. The second international attempted to coordinate the efforts of socialist parties and labor organizations to improve wages working conditions, and the like. Prior to World War I, it urged the workers not to support their governments in the event of war. But when war broke out, the workers, particularly in France and Germany, did support their governments. It was this action that prompted Lenin to denounce the Second International and to form in January 1919 a third or communist International. The Third International came to be called the Comintern. The Second Congress of the Comintern met in Petrograd and Moscow in July and August of 1920. There, Grigory Zinoviev, who had been installed as head of the Comintern, reaffirmed the ideas of the imminence of revolution in Europe 
and of the Second International as the principal enemy of that revolution. The Communist International was founded 15 months ago, and from its very first steps, it naturally had to cross swords with the Second International. Both our friends and our enemies in all Europe and America must face this fact and also recognize that our struggle has been crowned with success and that as a result of this duel, the Second International has been knocked in the head by the Third International. <laughs> the working class is coming into power and the bourgeoisie in its despair, seizes upon the half-dead Second International and strangles it in its dying grasp. There is no doubt that both are approaching definite ruin. Their collapse will make it possible for an international union of workmen to create a new world founded on communism. The idea of democracy has faded away before our very eyes. Zinovia went on to analyze the political situations in various countries and to attack measures taken in the United States and elsewhere which suppress the spread of revolutionary activities in the unsettled post-war years. He then made a familiar prediction. A short time will pass and the proletariat of all countries in a single outburst with a clearly defined aim and as a single entity will march forward to victory under the leadership of the Communist International. Long live the working class of the whole world. Long live the Communist International. <laughs> The principal speech on the opening day of the Congress was made by Lenin, who was greeted with enthusiastic applause as he made his report on the international situation. He, too, spoke in terms of an imminent revolution in Europe. A revolutionary crisis is at hand. This now raises a question. Can we place hope in the strength and organization of a revolutionary class, a class of oppressed, to overthrow the disintegrating society of exploiters? The exploited masses lack the revolutionary consciousness of the organization and preparedness of their vanguard, namely, that very thing for the sake of which we have come together at this second Congress of the Communist International. On our road are many difficulties, but they are passing with each day and with each hour. Everywhere we have advanced detachments. Everywhere we have proletarian armies, although poorly organized and needing reorganization. We are able to organize these into a single detachment, a single force. If you will help us accomplish this, then nothing will prevent us from accomplishing our task. And this task will be that of leading on to the victory of the world revolution and to the establishment of an international proletarian Soviet Republic. The executive committee of the Comintern formulated a series of theses or platform planks for presentation to the Congress. One of the chief authors of the many theses was Karl Radek, secretary of the executive committee. I shall read back section 18 of the platform resolution on the role of the Communist Party in the proletarian revolution. The basic starting point in the whole organization work of the Communist Party must be the creation of communist groups. Everywhere, wherever there is even a small number of proletarians or semi-proletarians, in every professional or trade union, 
in every cooperative organization, in every shop, in every governmental institution, everywhere where there can be found at least three people sympathetic with communism, it is necessary immediately to organize a communistic group. Only the organized activity of communists makes it possible for the vanguard of the working class to lead the whole class. All communist groups operating in non-party organizations must submit implicitly to the party organization as a whole, irrespective of whether the party is at the given moment legal or illegal. Communist groups of all kinds should recognize further subordination to each other in strict hierarchical order and as far as possible according to a most rigid system. <clears throat> Comrade Radek, will you also read back the preceding section of the resolution which stresses the importance of the illegal work of the party? Yes, section 17. In a country where the bourgeoisie or the counter-revolutionary social democracy is in power, the Communist Party must learn to coordinate its legal work with its illegal work. And the legal work must always be under the effective control of the illegal party. Throughout the Congress, great emphasis was placed upon the importance of communist infiltration whenever and wherever possible, and on the primacy of the illegal apparatus of the party. Communism as an international conspiracy was on the march. Trotsky, in his closing speech at the Congress, put it this way. The months since the founding of the Communist International have been rich in profound historic content. We must look backward in order to determine the road traveled. But without taking our eyes off the enemy and without losing time, go forward. Now we have come out on the road that leads to world communism. In 1921, the Comintern developed a tactical approach known as the United Front. This was an appeal direct to the workers over the heads of their social democratic leaders. It invited them to follow communist leadership and it urged them to make demands for wage increases and working conditions, demands so unreasonable as to create an irreconcilable situation between the workers on one hand and their employers and governments on the other. These efforts of the communists to break the workers away from their social democratic leaders failed. Attempts to foment revolution in Germany in 1923 and in Bulgaria in 1925 also ended in failure. Then, when the USSR found it advantageous to establish normal diplomatic and commercial relations with other states, the Kremlin leaders were quick to perceive that their widely advertised aims of world revolution were incompatible with the conduct of normal diplomacy. This resulted in changing the Comintern from being the vanguard of the world revolution to a kind of border guard for the Soviet fatherland. Stalin's attitude toward the Comintern is summed up in a word he used frequently when referring to it. He called it Lavochka, or Little General Store. By the time the 6th Congress of the International convened in July 1928, Stalin had successfully eliminated Trotsky and Zinoviev from all positions of leadership. Bukharin was now head of the Comintern, but it was Stalin who pulled the strings. The duties of the foreign communist parties to the USSR were clearly spelled out in a speech by Bukharin. And the USSR. Comrades, in view of the fact that the USSR is the only fatherland of the international proletariat, the principal bulwark of its achievements, and the most important factor for its international emancipation, the international proletariat must, on its part, facilitate the success of the work of socialist construction in the USSR, and defend her against the attacks of the imperialist nations by all means in its power. In the event of the imperialist states declaring war upon and attacking the USSR, 
the international proletariat must retaliate by organizing bold and determined mass action and struggle for the overthrow of the imperialist government with the slogan, dictatorship of the proletariat and alliance with the USSR. The development of the contradictions within the modern world economy lead inevitably to a mighty revolutionary outbreak which must overwhelm capitalism in a number of so-called civilized countries, unleash the victorious revolution in the colonies, broaden the base of the proletarian dictatorship to an enormous degree, and thus, with tremendous strides, bring nearer the final world victory of socialism. <laughs> The last Congress of the Comintern came when Stalin was preparing the bloody purge trials, which were to result in the execution of Bukharin, Zinoviev, Kamyenev, and thousands of other party members. During these years, fascism was thriving in Italy, and in Germany, the black shadow of Hitler began to spread over Europe. In response to these events, the Soviet Union in 1934 joined the League of Nations, an organization which Lenin had called a den of robbers. Soviet Foreign Minister Maxim Litvinov began making overtures which required a new tactical line in the common term. The result was the Popular Front, which became an integral part of the new Soviet search for protective alliances. At the 7th Congress of the common term in Moscow in 1935, the Popular Front tactic was announced. The head of the common term at this time was the Bulgarian Stalinist Georgi Dimitrov. Comrades! Millions of workers and toilers in the capitalist countries are asking the question, how can fascism be prevented from coming to power and how can fascism be overthrown after it has come to power? To this, the Communist International replies, the first thing that must be done is to establish a united front to form unity of action of the workers in every district, every factory, every country all over the world. The Communist International places no condition for unity of action except one, that the unity of action be directed against fascism, against the offensive of capital, against the threat of war, and against the class enemy. This is our condition. Communists, of course, must not and cannot for a moment abandon their independent work of communist education, organization, and mobilization of the masses. However, in order to make sure that the workers find the road of unity of action, it will be necessary to strive at the same time for long-term and short-term agreements providing for joint action with social democratic parties reformist trade unions, and organizations of toilers against the class enemies of the proletariat. The policy announced by Dimitrov differed in every respect but one from the policies followed before 1935. The main purpose of the Comintern was still world victory for communism, but the Popular Front called for direct cooperation with the leaders of the Social Democratic and other Labour parties. The key to this shift in tactics is to be found in Stalin's belated recognition of the Nazi threat to the Soviet Union. Stalin had hoped that the rising power of the Nazis would be directed solely against the Western democracies. However, Nazi diplomatic negotiations with Poland and the Baltic states served to revive traditional Russian fears about German expansionist aid. In the May 1936 elections in France, the Popular Front won 386 seats, and a Popular Front ministry was formed with Leon Blum, a socialist, as premier. While ostensibly supporting the government, the communist leaders refused to accept ministry posts, an equivocal position which did much to weaken the Popular Front government. Six weeks later, the civil war broke out in Spain. Following the intervention of Hitler and Mussolini, the Soviet Union became involved. 
the Stalinist purge trials were getting underway in Russia. And as part of their price for assistance to the Spanish loyalists, Soviet leaders demanded the right to purge all socialist, anarchist, and Trotskyite elements within the Republican camp. As within the Soviet Union, the purge was carried out with equal efficiency in Spain by agents of the Stalinist secret police. Believe me, I'm as sympathetic toward the, toward the Soviet Union as any other anti-fascist. Well, why do you suppose I volunteered for this godforsaken war? My brother, some of the things I see make me stop and think, you know, I saw a guy picked up just like that well, for making some crack or other about Stalin. Well, what's the matter with you? You look green. On your feet, soldier. You're under arrest. You're kidding. Well, what for? Shut up. Come along. All right, uh, bring in the next case. I have a report here representing conclusive proof that you're one of the agents of the counter-revolutionary conspiracy and also an agent of international fascism. Therefore, wait a minute. You're not an officer in my brigade. Now, if there's, there's some phony charge against me, I want to know about it. You can't just sit there and accuse me. Now, of listen me. to me and listen carefully. I not only can accuse you, I am your prosecutor, I'm your judge, and, in a manner of speaking, your executioner. And that's all. What are you going to do? You mean I can just take off? Yeah, you can just take off. In the present international situation, there is not nor can there be any more certain criterion than one's attitude toward the Soviet Union in determining who is a supporter and who an opponent of democracy and peace. You cannot carry on a real struggle against fascism if you do not lend all possible support in strengthening the USSR. You cannot carry on a serious struggle against the fascist perpetrators of another world bloodbath unless you lend all possible support to the Soviet Union. You cannot carry on a sincere struggle for socialism in your own countries if you do not oppose the enemies of the USSR and you cannot be a real friend of the Soviet Union if you do not condemn its enemies, the trotsky Bukharanite agents of fascism. This was the party line in 1937. Nazism and fascism were then the arch enemies of the Soviet Union. Only two years later, on August 23, 1939, Stalin signed his infamous pact with Hitler. This pact came as a surprise even to the communist parties in the West. For 10 days, they were left without instructions from Moscow. The result was a tragicomic model of conflicting statements the majority of them inconsistent with the new Kremlin policy. But by the time of the Soviet invasion of Eastern Poland in mid-September, all of the parties had received their official instructions, and there was no longer any difference between the line as stated by the French, British, and other communist parties. Neither was there any more doubt in the eyes of the world about the Comintern as a direct agent of Soviet policy. On May 22, 1943, the Soviet Union launched one of its more successful propaganda efforts, the dissolution of the Comintern. When asked by a British journalist to give his views on the subject, Stalin gave the following answer. The dissolution of the Communist International is proper and timely because it facilitates the organization of the common onslaught of all freedom-loving peoples against the common enemy, Hitlerism. It exposes the lie of the Hitlerites to the effect that uh, Moscow allegedly intends to intervene in the life of other countries and to Bolshevize them. 
It exposes the calumny of the adversaries of communism within the labor movement to the effect that communist parties in various countries allegedly are not acting in the interests of their people, but on order from outside. Actually, the Comintern was not dissolved, but went underground. Henceforth, the communist parties outside of Russia simply took their orders not from the Comintern, but directly from the Soviet Politburo itself. When the armies of the Grand Alliance met on April 25, 1945, the world was weary of war. By taking advantage of this fact, the Soviet Union was able to convert all of its military gains into political acquisitions. The aim of world revolution became converted into the aim of world conquest. Between the years 1945 and 1948, nearly a hundred million Europeans came under Soviet rule. The communist parties of France and Italy became important political forces. Mao Zedong and his communist armies were successfully fighting the Kuomintang in China. And throughout Asia and the Middle East, communists emerged in strength. In recent years, communist pressure has been evident in the newly independent countries of Africa. In fact, the communist parties have enjoyed far greater success since 1945 than in the days of the Comintern. In October 1947, a communist information bureau, the Common Form, was set up in Belgrade. It included representatives of the communist parties of the Soviet Union, France, Italy, and six of the East European People's Democracies. A year later, Tito and Yugoslavia were expelled from the Common Form. Its offices were moved to Bucharest to be more directly under Soviet control. Subsequent events in East Berlin, Poznan, Warsaw, and Budapest exploded the myth of communism as a political ideology, enjoying the support of a majority of the working people. The Comintern and the common form no longer exist. However, we must not forget that they were only temporary means to an end which has not changed. Today, the Soviet government itself has assumed the task of directing communists all over the world toward that end. And that end was, and still is, communist world domination. Our next program will examine communism in the United States. Historical consultant, Witold Swarakowski. This is National Educational Television.